All right, so today we're going to talk about how, how experiments in physics work, but specifically experiments in optics lab, and how statistical analysis on those experiments work. So this is lecture one, lecture one, um, statistics, statistics and data taking. So I'll start with an example. And this is one of the ex experiments that you can choose to perform. And I will draw the, the very simplest version of, of this experiment. And the experiment is to explore how lenses and how imaging work. So if you have a lens, there's some focal distance associated with this lens, say 10 centimeters. And what that means is that light that's coming in from infinity, light that's coming in, say, from the sun or some uh, you know, the stars, light that's coming in parallel, uh, in parallel rays, gets focused roughly 10 centimeters uh, back from, from the center of the lens. That's what it means to have a focal length of 10 centimeters. But when you have light that's not coming from infinitely far away, say you have light coming from some object along an optical axis, that some distance, say O away, this is the object distance, it ends up getting focused at a different distance. So uh, a distance i away, say. And let's, let's imagine that the image is actually upside down and the distance from the center of the lens out to the place where the image comes into focus, we call that i. And I'll go through this derivation or you will go through some of this derivation in one of the future uh, lectures or, or homeworks. The relationship between these three quantities object distance, image distance, and focal distance is that one over O plus one over I equals one over F. And one of the experiments on the first day, one of the things you do is you take a lens and you measure its focal length by taking an object and putting it at a bunch of different object distances and measure with a camera the distance at which it comes into focus. And you want to verify this relationship. And so, the first thing I will point out is that this relationship is not linear, right? There's one overs all over the place. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize in Optics Lab is that if you can turn an experiment into some linear relationship, your life is a lot easier. And uh, doing the data analysis is usually a lot simpler and more straightforward. And so what we will actually do is we will actually make a plot of not the independent variable that you're changing O, but one over O. So on our X, Y plot, our X axis is actually gonna be one over O and our Y axis is gonna be the thing that we measure, the image distance, the distance at which things come to a focus, one over I. And if you were to write this, this is, we can write this as X plus Y, and if you solve for Y, you see that this is a linear relationship. It's, it's uh, Y, Y equals, uh, just right here, Y equals one over F minus X. So it's a line with a slope of minus one and an intercept of one over F. So here's, here's our theoretical model. And uh, let me just say this intercept here is one over F. So this is our theoretical model. And what you'll actually do is you'll actually choose a bunch of different object distances, which will turn into one over object distances. You will make this measurement and you will fit a line. Now, what is the procedure for fitting a line? Well, in, in good physics experiments and here in optics lab, what we'll do is we'll do this experiment for multiple object distances but also for each object distance, we'll do it multiple times. And say you pick you know, seven or so uh, different, different object distances. And for each of those, you'll put the object at that, dis at that distance as best you can, and you'll measure the image distance. And then you'll, you'll go through the whole sequence over and over and over again, because every time you put the object there, it's not gonna be at exactly where you think it's gonna be. There's a little bit of error associated with that. Um, which you don't quite quite know about. Uh, and 
you'll make the measurement and there'll be a little bit of error associated with where you measure your, your image distance. And so by repeating this whole procedure five times for, or sorry, by, by, by taking, uh, you know, by taking say seven data points, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven data points and repeating each data point five times, so cycling through all seven uh, distances five times, you'll, you'll get data that has some average and has some uncertainty associated with it. So let me just imagine drawing, drawing some, some data with some uncertainty here. There's a point there. Uh, say this point here is uh, right on the line and these points here are quite above the line. And this point here is below the line. And sometimes the, sometimes the error bars hit the line, sometimes they don't. Uh, but you get seven, seven data points, each with its uncertainty. And then you want to fit a line and get the best, best fit line. And then you want to ask a couple questions. So one is, how good was my model? Is this actually a good model for my data? Two, did, did I take data reasonably? Uh, three, if I extract a fit parameter like the intercept here, one over F, what is the uncertainty on, on one over F? What is the uncertainty on that parameter? And four, if I know an uncertainty on one over F, how do I turn that into an uncertainty on the actual focal length of the lens? Let me say this is approximately because you know, no lens is manufactured perfectly. Um, so if I, if I measure 10 centimeters, is that 10.0000 or you know, 10 centimeters plus or minus one centimeter? How well, how well can I do? And we'll start to answer all those questions today. But in all the statistics I'm going to do for the next three classes, basically, keep in mind this, this experiment. And uh, this will be sort of our, our, our paradigm example of an experiment. And today, I'm not going to talk at all about fitting, fitting the curve. I'm just going to focus on a single, uh, a single object distance and how do we get this point and how do we get the error bars on that point? So that's, that's where we're gonna go today. All right, so um, I'm gonna start by saying that there's a lot of things that are uncertain. So actual physical sources of error and uncertainty in your measurements. And you probably know this from previous classes, but there are systematic errors where you, you don't understand something properly or you screw something up uh, those are the errors that are really specific to each experiment and are not something that we can address in general. But there are also random errors. You know, your measuring instruments are not perfectly accurate. When you place an object at a certain distance, it's never going to be perfectly accurate. Uh, I can, the thermal fluctuations, when you make electrical measurements, there's always noise, either picking up radio frequency stuff or just thermal noise. Um, when we measure the brightness of objects, it, at some fundamental level, you're counting individual photons. And so there's always some fluctuation. So there's always lots of different sources of noise. And often there's more than one source of noise. And when you have lots of different sources of noise and they all contribute a little bit to this data point here, uh, what, what you learn from, from uh, your math classes and from maybe statistical mechanics is, is the central limit theorem. And that says that when you have a lot of independent sources of, of noise, no matter how the individual sources of noise are distributed, the, the net result is that you get a distribution that uh, follows this, the, that, that, that's a Gaussian. So let me just write down the, the probability of measuring a particular value y. So again, we're just talking about one data point here. Probability of measuring a particular y is going to be distributed according to this Gaussian distribution, one over square root of two pi sigma squared e to the minus, uh, oops, uh, y minus mu. Squared over sigma squared or two sigma squared, I should say. Okay, so let me just draw this and remind you what this means. So this means that the probability, uh, is really a probability density, the probability of actually measuring a y between 
that number and that number plus dy is distributed according to this Gaussian. And the peak of this distribution and the average, we'll see in a second, the average value that you would measure is mu. And in some sense, the width of this distribution, one-sided width is, is sigma. So uh, let me say a couple properties of this. The one property is that it's normalized. Normalized, so the integral from minus infinity to infinity uh, of p of y dy, this is one. And the true mean, so what this means is if you were to draw, if you were to set your, your object at a particular distance, you were to, to draw lots and lots and lots and lots of y values from this distribution, you know, in the limit where you draw an infinite number of, of y values, the actual mean of these y values, uh, you can calculate mathematically as this, the expectation value of y. This is defined as the integral from minus infinity to infinity for any probability distribution of y times that probability distribution. And for this, as you might expect, you get out mu, the true mean. And the true, true variance This is defined as the, uh, the average of the square distance between draws of this distribution, if you're picking numbers out of this distribution, minus the mean. So the distance from the mean squared. And uh, let me just, do I have enough room here? Barely, I'll write a little bit small, sorry about that. Minus infinity, infinity to infinity. Y, so you already need to know the true mean here, y minus mu squared, p of y, dy. This gives you sigma squared. So sigma squared is the true variance. Sigma is called the true standard deviation. And these are the true mean and the true variance or true standard deviation are to be distinguished from the the means and variances that you will form from the fact that you are not going to do this experiment an infinite number of times, but you're in fact going to do each point roughly five times. In Optics Lab, five is sort of a reasonable number to, to uh, repeat each measurement by. All right, so I think one of the things that's most confusing for people in this first little section is that there are gonna be a bunch of things that all kind of are mean-like, are average-like, and a bunch of things that are all kind of variance-like or a standard deviation-like, and keeping them all straight is going to be the hardest thing. So the first ones we've been introduced to are the true mean and the true variance. So let's talk about the, the, next, the next thing, which is that we, we are going to draw a finite number of samples in order to make each data point. And again, for, for optics experiments, that finite number is about five but I'll, I'll keep it general. I'll say, uh, we'll draw, uh, for, for each X value, we'll make about five Y measurements. And what we want to do is we want to form the, what's called the sample mean. Um, another color here. So the sample mean, mean, we're gonna call this Y bar. This is literally just the average of all the points you draw. So uh, Y1 plus Y2 plus all the way up to Y n, and then you're gonna divide that all by n. So you're gonna take the, the average of all the, all the points. And you can use this, this sample mean here uh, to estimate your true mean. So, so what does that mean? That means that on average, if you did this procedure a bajillion times where you made five measurements and took the average, made another five measurements and took the average, made another five measurements and took the average, the hope is that the expectation value 
of this y bar will converge to the true mean. So, so let's check that. Let me rewrite this a little bit more formally as one over n times the sum from n equals one to n of y sub n. And let's just check that the expectation value of y bar is what we think it should be. All right, so how do we do that? Well, this expectation value, uh, we're taking the expectation value of each of these samples, and we know that the expectation value of each sample is mu. And if we, uh, this expectation value is linear, so any pre-scaling factor or any sum uh, doesn't affect the expectation value. I could just literally, uh, instead of having a single y, I could write out this whole sum of y's and factor everything out. That means I can bring this expectation value inside of the, of the sum here. So this, uh, this means that expectation values n goes from one to n of the expectation value uh, of each, each of these draws. And if I really am measuring the same data point five times, these should all have the same expectation value. So now I have one over n, sum from n equals one to n of mu. And so here I have a sum of one to n of the same number n times. So this just gives me one over n times n copies of mu, and that's just mu. So oh great, right away, we, our uh, suspicion is confirmed. In fact, if, if I do this procedure uh, a bajillion times, on average, I expect that this, this expression is a good unbiased estimate of the true mean. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about something that's less intuitive, which is the sample variance. So this is the sample mean, the sample variance. This expression is, looks a little bit like the true variance, but there's a, there's a twist here. So uh, this is gonna be called, instead of sigma squared, we're gonna call this S squared to use the English letter. And S squared is going to be one, not one over N, but one over N minus one. This is where the, the non-intuitive uh, part comes in. Times the sum from N equals one to N of uh, the distance between each measurement that you make and not the true mean. If we knew the true, if we knew the true mean, uh, we wouldn't have to have this uh, one over n minus one, but all we, all we have from our five data points uh, are the, the sample mean. So we, we have to form, form our quantity uh, based on the sample mean. All right, now, one of the things that I am not going to prove, but it is hinted at and should, should probably be part of your first homework is to just go through the same exercise of taking the expectation value of this expression, the expectation value of S squared. And what you will find is despite the fact that this is a one over N minus one, once you- Off screen a little. Oh, is that off screen? Sorry. Uh, thank you. The camera moves moves around a little bit, or I don't I don't actually know what's moving around. Something's moving around a little bit, so the borders are always not quite quite as well defined. Um, let me let me just say so. This is part of your part of your homework is to certainly in Python demonstrate that this is correct, but uh, also uh, either prove mathematically or at least read read the Wikipedia page that I cite uh, on proving that the expectation value of this S squared, if you do this procedure of picking five numbers and forming Y bar and then forming S squared, you do that over and over and over again, on average, the expectation value of S squared is going to be sigma squared. And that's not true if you have a one over N. It's only true if you have a one over N minus one. And remember N, we're not really taking into infinity. We don't have an infinite amount of time in optics lab. We're, we have to divide our time between taking lots of data points and taking the same data point over and over and over again. And a good compromise tends to be taking the same data point around five times. And so the difference between one fifth and one fourth is, is meaningful. You need to get that right. And this is something that you will simulate uh, and prove to yourself in, in Python that by doing this procedure 
over and over again, you do in fact get the get the correct uh, that, that this quantity here, this S squared, is what's called an unbiased estimator of the true variance. All right, now this is a little bit subtle because while S squared is an unbiased estimator of the true variance, is actually not true. Not true that the expectation value of S, if you take the square root of this expression, um, is, is sigma. So let me just, I don't know, too many knots. It's not true that this is true. Let me just make sure that S itself is, is not actually an unbiased estimator of sigma. So you have to be a little bit careful. Fortunately, all of the things we're going to do with this involve S squareds. Now, what, what, what is the good of this? Well, I, I erase my little plot. Let me, let me draw, let me draw my little, uh, op, my uh, canonical optics experiment again with some data points and some error bars. So here's my X, the, the knob that I'm turning and my Y, the thing I'm measuring. And here's some line for the model. And at each point, I'm only gonna draw a few now, each point there's gonna be a dot and that dot is Y bar for that particular point, uh, Y bar sub N. And this dot is gonna come with some error bars. And the size of each error bar is going to be S. And I said that uh, mathematically, we, we want to work with S squared because that is the thing that is the un, unbiased estimator. That is the thing that on average gives us the right answer. It doesn't systematically give us a, an answer that's a little bit higher, or a little bit lower. Uh, but why, why are physicists so obsessed with the standard deviation itself? And the draw, we draw the error bars of S and everything. Well, you know, the answer is pretty, pretty trivial. It's that S has the same units as Y, so we can put it on the same plot. So, uh, it, it is meaningful, uh, but we have to be a little bit careful mathematically that uh, that when when we when we do these procedures, the thing that's the unbiased estimator is is s squared, not not s itself. And, and you'll see in your homework when you simulate these things that in fact, when when you do this procedure, you know, ten thousand or a million times, I don't remember how many times I asked you to do it, uh, it is true that s squared, on average, does give you the right sigma squared. But that if you took the square root and plotted a histogram of those square roots, it would be systematically, systematically biased to be uh, a little too low, I guess. Uh, Jason? Yes. Isn't, isn't, don't we want a well, one over root n in, in how big the error bar is? Oh, oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. Yes, yes. No, you're right. You're right. I haven't. Aha, aha. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me, let me erase this. Let me pretend you, pretend you never saw that because the very next thing I'm gonna talk about is, is exactly this, this issue. Uh, this is what happens when I deviate from my notes and draw a picture that I didn't draw in my notes. All right, so. Let me, let me go there. Uh, all right, well, actually, but before I go there, let me, let me talk about the intuition behind this here. So why, why is it that we're dividing by a number that's a little bit smaller than, than n? And this intuition plays a role a little bit later too. So I think it'll be useful. So let's, let's imagine that we have some, some y here, and there's a true mean. And the true mean is right here. The true mean is mu. And what we do is we draw, say, five, five samples here. One, two, three, four, five. Say we just happen to, to measure this thing five times, and we get these, these five numbers here. Uh, what you can see from these five numbers is that if we were to actually form the mean of these five y values, the, the actual mean that we would form is 
a little bit high for this particular set of, of numbers that we happen to draw. So this is a uh, Y bar. Uh, so what this means is that when we calculate the, the variance, when we calculate the distance between each of these points and Y bar, the distance between each of these points and Y bar is gonna be on average a little bit smaller than the distance between these points and mu. Right, because our, our, our samples happen to be a little bit high. They happen to pull the average a little bit high. And no matter which way they pull it, uh, when we calculate the, the distance from the sample mean instead of the true mean, that distance is going to be a little bit smaller on average than the distance to the true mean. And so we would have to divide by, uh, divide by a, a smaller number in order to get the, uh, in order to get an unbiased estimate of the variance, so that's kind of a, a qualitative way of motivating that this number in the denominator has to be a little bit smaller than than n. In fact, I can form something that uh, it would also be true. Let me let me just say this: it's also true that if you happen to knew if you happen to know the the true mean. If you knew for some physical reason that you were absolutely certain that the true mean was zero or seven or whatever it was, you could also form this by saying uh, this is one over n times the sum of n equals one to n of each of your, your data measurements minus the true mean. So this would also be a perfectly good unbiased estimator. Uh, oops. The expectation value of s squared this way is sigma squared. But here we're using the true mean. And again, because on average, the, the average gets pulled a little bit toward wherever you happen to have uh, drawn more samples from, this number is a little bit bigger. And so we have to divide by a slightly bigger number than n minus one in order to get the same, same, uh, same variance out. All right, that was the picture I meant to draw, not the, uh, not the other picture. Okay. So uh, let me bring up what, what Nicholas just said, which is that now what, now what we have is, is we have a bunch, of, a bunch of measurements and we have a bunch of, uh, uh, a bunch of means, one mean for each data point. So let me, let me draw the picture I, was, I, I drew before. So here's our X, here's our Y, here's our model. And we have a bunch of means. So, you know, and in the picture I drew before, we had seven means. Let me draw a few more here just to round it out. And we want to determine what are the error bars that we're gonna draw on each of these. So each of these becomes Y bar sub N. And we wanna know what the error bars are. Okay. Now, let me motivate this a little bit, and next time I'll, I'll, I'll prove it. But what do we want these error bars to mean? Well, from the central limit theorem, we know that if I take a bunch of independent variables, and I draw, even if I'm not drawing them from Gaussian distributions, I'm gonna add them all up and divide by n. So I'm taking an average. I'm gonna add, add a bunch of things up. In the central limit theorem, it says that even if each one isn't individually distributed as a Gaussian, the more of these independent things I add up, the, the more likely the, or the more Gaussian the, the result is, is distributed. And so for each data point I choose to take, I'm gonna form an average. And say I did this experiment over and over and over and over again. So I did this whole experiment. I formed my average for this particular point and I plunk down a point, and I form my average for, for this particular x value, uh, or I, I, I set my knob to this particular x value, and I do my five measurements, I form my point, put it down. I do that over and over and over again. What I want to know isn't, isn't the quantity uh, s exactly. It's not if I went to this knob position and I made a sixth measurement, what would be its the width of its Gaussian, 
What I want to know is if I did five more measurements and I averaged them together, roughly how far off should I, should I be? And, uh, and those are the error bars that I want to put on, on each data point. And as, as Professor Bresnay pointed out, each side of this data point um, is, not, is not S, but it's S over the square root of N. So just intuitively, the more measurements I make, the better estimate of the mean I will have. And so uh, we already have two, two means, right? We have the true mean mu and the sample mean Y bar. And we already have two variances. We have the true variance, sigma squared, and the sample variance, S squared. Um, and now this thing is going to be a third variance type variable. And we're going to call this the, the uh, standard error of the mean, so S sub Y bar. It's the spread in measurements. If I were to take a bunch of measurements of Y bar by doing n measurements and averaging them together, doing n measurements and averaging them together, n measurements and averaging them together, this is going to be an estimate for the width of that distribution. So S sub Y bar, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be this value. And next time I will prove that this square root of N is, is the right value, but you're all going to go off to lab at some point uh, this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon or Friday afternoon. Uh, and at least two thirds of you will, will not have seen me prove it, but uh, you will almost certainly have time to simulate this and, and show that this is the right, uh, the right quantity to, to put here uh, for, for the, you'll plot the distribution of a bunch of these averages and show that the width of that distribution is given by this, uh, this expression here. Uh, okay, so that, that, will, that will be motivated again and proved next time. So I think it is, we have about a minute left. Were there any questions that I didn't address properly or any other things I said incorrectly? Professor Bresne, thank you. There's a question from Helen. Oh, so, yes. So, um, so when we're using S, when we're using um, the standard deviation, um, you mentioned that that this was going to be a, a biased indicator of standard deviation. Um, so you're saying we can just use that um, bias, um, like square root of the variance, anyway. You can, are you, you can draw pictures of it. You can put it on plots. That it it does have a physical meaning. It is <clears throat> it is the so S itself. Uh, well, let, let me. You can draw pictures of it, and and the reason why it's useful to draw pictures of it is it has the same units as Y itself, right? S S squared has units of Y squared, so you couldn't really put it on the same picture. So it's useful in the sense of drawing pictures. When we say use it, what I mean is that um, starting next time and the time after that, when we actually do the procedure for fitting a curve, we will never actually use S itself. We will always use S squared. I see, okay. Does that, does that help put that in yeah. context? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was wondering whether you were like doing something to S here that like made it unbiased. No, but. this this picture is biased in the sense that if you were to draw this picture a bajillion times and take a little ruler and measure the error bars, um, they it, it wouldn't be on, on average those error bars would not actually be uh, the the standard deviation of of this Gaussian. You would have to square the error bars and then average those together. And then you could take the square root at the end. Or let, well, yeah. It, this is oh, Jason, it's, a, I, it's a little subtle. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to ask a quick question. I know we're basically at the end of time. In terms of today's and tomorrow's uh, lab sections, can you give us the 20 minute expectation setting? What are people, what should people do? Where should they go? How, what do they expect to be doing in the course of the lab? 
20 minute expectation setting. We have we don't Sorry, have 20 second minutes. expectations. Oh, <laughs> um, go the, each each professor has a Zoom link, which I sent out over email and is on Sakai. Go to that Zoom link. The, and uh, there is something called homework one, which you should open and start start doing basically. Um, install Python, install Jupyter Notebook if you don't already have that. Um, start start going through it. It's kind of like a tutorial. It starts really slow and gentle, and uh, by the end, it's like okay, now you know now do this procedure ten thousand times, and you have to write some code to do a loop to make it happen ten thousand times. So, uh, but it it builds up uh, over time. We will be grading this mostly on completeness. And you should feel free to ask, you know, I would say hop on Zoom uh, and ask the professor who's leading your lab section any question about statistics, theoretically, or uh, any question about the homework or the tutorial. Um, it, it might not be the most perfectly and clearly written thing because it's only been used once last year. Uh, but uh, hopefully you will you will get a better sense for all of these things and the you know the difference between these three different types the true variance and the sample variance and the sample variance of the mean you know this is kind of confusing but when you actually simulate experiments over and over and over again uh, the the point of this is to give you a better sense of that so at the end of the at the end of the two weeks you will hand in basically a PDF printout of what you did. And we will look through it and check that you did all of the, the things and you did them roughly correctly. Um, but you know, for those of you who haven't used Jupyter Notebooks or uh, NumPy or Matplotlib, the plotting library, uh, this is this is the way to get started. For those of you who have used all of those things, which you know, I, I don't know actually what fraction of the class that is. Maybe we could take a quick poll, just because I'm curious. Um, actually, how polls no polls created let's let's do that oh jesus took me to a web page forget it you can save it for friday jason forget it i thought i could just ask a question um if you have used these things you'll probably blast through the first part of this lab pretty quickly um but you know i think for for you don't think of this as learning numpy and how to plot stuff think of it as getting practice distinguishing between all these subtle subtly different uh, you know, means and variances and, and stuff like that. Um, was that, that was more than 20 seconds, but less than 20 minutes. Thank you, Jason. All right. I will, I will see some of you tomorrow and some of you on Friday.